Um, it gives me great pleasure to, uh, well, to have been asked by, by uh, Saidi and Sia Pumalela to chair this session. And uh, I'm really uh, thrilled to be um, introducing you to William Sor uh, Michael Sorrell, um, who's the president of the Paul Quinn College in Dallas. And uh, believe it or not, it's a 147-year-old historically black college in the US. It's a small institution, 550 students, which, uh, you know, which kind of really uh, quite different from our kind of mega storms. I don't know what, I don't know what to call them. We have uh, all of our universities are quite huge and so on. Um, but just to say that when uh, Michael joined um, the Paul Quinn College, the throughput rate was 5%. And so, uh, uh, why he took the job, <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> he'll tell us, he'll tell us. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Wall Street, I, I read a couple of articles about him yesterday, but one of them is in the Wall Street Journal, and I really recommend that to you. If you just Google William Sorrell, it'll come up with the Wall Street Journal article, and uh, just do have a look at it, because it'll explain a whole range of things. Uh, that graduation rate, by the way, has now shifted from 5% to 25%, which is fantastic, and uh, very quickly kind of getting to the average, I understand, of the uh, historically black colleges of 35%. Right? So it's getting to the kind of the national average, if you like that. Um, and I think one of the most uh, beautiful little phrases in that uh, Wall Street Journal article is that uh, uh, what Michael has done is uh, shifted the institution uh, from being an institution in need to an institution for the needy, which is actually such a powerful uh, kind of statement and such a powerful kind of uh, uh, shift kind of in focus, if you like. And so um, so uh, I'd like all of you just to really warmly uh, welcome Michael and thank you for making this long journey, which is... Um, and I'm pretty sure that you're suffering from jet lag and all of that. <laughs> but we really look forward to hearing uh, your story today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're going to start this again. Um, I am indeed the president of a historically black college. Historically black colleges come from the black church tradition. Mm -hmm. The black church tradition in America is a call and response tradition. It means when I say something to you, you say something back. Five people said something back to start with. We're going to see if we can get everyone engaged this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Doesn't that feel better? All right. Now, we have another tradition in America in the black church tradition, and that is the offering plate, which I will be passing around <laughs> after we get done. All right. It is indeed a pleasure to be with you this morning. This is my first trip to Africa, and I just stand in awe of everything that this continent means and everything this continent has come to represent. Um, as a descendant of this continent in a very, very real way, I have always wondered what it would be like to walk on its soil. And so I want to thank you for the opportunity to have this experience and to have this experience talking about the things that I care so deeply about. So thank you for, uh, it is worth any jet lag that I might experience, all right? Um, we live in a very, very difficult time. Our students are angry. Our students are frustrated. Our students represent what our society feels. And I think sometimes in education, we believe that we can insulate ourselves from these realities. We cannot. We must embrace these realities. Uh, my mother once told me, she said, son, you're not being built for the sun. You're being built for the rain. You're being built to lead. And when you are built to lead, that means, in fact, you are built for the rain. So we are higher education leaders. We are charged with 
creating paths forward for our communities, for our countries, and for when those times are faced with rain. It is storming outside. Therefore, we must be better shelters against those storms. What we're going to talk about today is what it looks like to be a shelter against that storm. Our story is a tale from the front line of poverty. At Paul Quinn College, we call ourselves the Quinite Nation. And we started calling ourselves the Quinite Nation when we were literally the Quinite two people, okay? Because we were much smaller than we are today. But we always had nation building aspirations. We believe that students respond best to a different form of education and a different environment, one which reflects the realities of their lives. What we're going to talk about today is how you build a movement that addresses the reality of your students' lives, and you do it not from a place of apology, but from a place of assertiveness, from a place of faith, from a place of believing that your next must be better than your now. And that's where we're going this morning. So if that's okay with you, are, are we okay with that? <sighs> you flunked the first test. That was a test. We, I just talked about call and response. One more time. Is that okay? Yes. Thank you. I was beginning to think only six people showed up that time. All right. So one of my favorite quotes is from Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, and one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? Now, people like to romanticize Dr. King, and they talk about the I have a dream version of Dr. King, because I don't know about in South Africa, but in America, we like to reduce people's um, legacies to whatever is the most comfortable moment in our lives. So we remember him standing on the steps giving a speech that is full of hope, full of aspiration. But we edit out the version of Dr. King of who he was towards the end of his life. And he was someone who had become deeply concerned about poverty, someone who spoke to the pain that people felt on an everyday basis. That is the version of Dr. King that I respect the most because it showed an evolution. It showed the ability to address the needs of the day. Why are we a world in which there are so many people who live in poverty? It's a question that we must continue to ask ourselves over and over again. And then when I was in school, one of my favorite pieces of literature was The Odyssey by Homer. And The Iliad and the Odyssey was a companion work. And in one, ver in one piece of it, um, Achilles' teacher was explaining to people what his task was. And the task was to teach young Achilles to be both a speaker of words and a doer of deeds. To me, that is in essence what we are charged with every day in higher education, is to teach our students to be people who are capable of speaking words because the power of our narrative, the power of words is significant. But if all we do is sit on stages and talk and then don't go out and do the work, then we have failed. So we must ourselves be speakers of words and doers of deeds, but we must teach our students to be speakers of words and doers of deeds as well. I would argue in our world, we are at war against our future. This I love this picture because it is gut-wrenching. It is a picture of a child looking out of a window where there is light coming in the window. So she is full of hope, but her reality is one of despair. This is what we are tasked with as we lift our students out of poverty. We are tasked with taking the, the natural hope that they still have in them. Because let us be clear, if they did not have that hope, they would not be making the investment of coming to our institutions. So that hope is still there. But it is surrounded by the realities of lives that are hard. 
I never want to lose the picture, the mental picture that I take with me every day because this is how some of my students live. And I know that because I've been to many of their homes. I've walked their communities. I've walked their high schools. I've met their families. I don't need anyone to translate what their lives are like for me because I've experienced their lives. And this cannot be the lives that we send our students back to. In America, our students are poor. For the first time in our nation's history, the majority of students in public K-12 education reside in low-income families. They come from poverty. Let me give you a very real translation of what that means in, in our country. We have a program called Free and Reduced Lunches. It is how many students who come from these communities eat a balanced meal every day. It started out as just lunches, but the reality is many schools are now providing breakfast for the students as well. But it only works if you're in school. So for many of our students, when the summer comes, and by the way, we are still based on an agrarian model as if we need our students to be off from school and farm in the summers. That's not what our students do in the summers anymore. They're not farming. So I, I will tell you, it is time for a new model where students go to school year round, but that's not the speech that you all asked me to give. So I'll stay away from that one today, all right? But just know the next time I come back, we're gonna talk about rebooting the entire educational calendar. But our students are poor. If you, if you come from poverty, you come from trauma, all right? The trauma that uncertainty breeds. If you don't know where your next meal is coming from, how are you in a mental space to learn? If you don't know if when you flip the lights, when you get home, that they're going to come on, that there will be heat, how are you going to learn literature? or math, or science. We have not taken responsibility for the poverty in our students' lives in our country. That is unacceptable, and that is what we have designed a system to eradicate. Now, our students are not only poor in America, they're also unprepared. Only 46% of the students that took one of the college, let's call it standardized tests, uh, the SAT, were considered college ready. Here's the thing about that 46%. Those are just the students that had aspirations of going to college. What about all the students who didn't? So we have a school system in our country that less than half of the students are being prepared for what comes next. That number becomes even worse when you're talking about African Americans and Latinx students. 31% of our Latinx students were considered college ready, and only 20% of our African American students were considered college ready. Our school system is failing. Not only are our school systems failing, but our colleges are failing as well. 79% of employers have stated that they want their entry level hires to come to them with real world experience. Now, let's just stop there for a second. I thought entry level meant that you were starting, that people were going to train you for what comes next. So how the employers decided that we're gonna let somebody else train, that's a whole nother conversation but 79% of the people who are our customers. Because in higher education, let us be clear, we are in a business. We have customers. Our customers are twofold. They are the companies that hire our graduates, and then they are our graduates themselves who are saying to us, prepare us for careers. Because that's why people go to college. Right? They don't go to college. I mean, maybe some people go to college just for the sake of learning. I think that's great. And I think if you're one of those people, God bless you. Okay? 
But for the rest of us who went to college concerned about getting a job, 50% of those students said that they wished college had helped them be prepared for their careers. So roughly 80% of one customer base is unhappy, and half of the other customer base is unhappy. Apparently, the only people that were happy were the colleges who kept getting paid to produce bad results. That's not what this should look like. Our colleges are also expensive. So they're not preparing the students for what the future holds, and they cost too much. 70% of our college graduates are left with significant student debt. 44 million graduates have $1.5 trillion of debt. $1.5 trillion. It took me a minute to fully appreciate $1.5 trillion. Because, you know, you had to get past 100,000. You had to get past hundreds of millions. You then had to get past hundreds of billions. You're in a neighborhood that is rarefied air for all the wrong reasons. Okay, $1.5 trillion of student debt. The average student debt is now $37,172. Just to get a degree. With the hopes that you can get a job that, by the way, the people who are going to hire you don't think you're prepared for. That is not a great relationship. Okay, if you are involved in a relationship like that, you are in an abusive relationship. All right, and we need to talk, okay? Here's the thing. There are people out there that can fix this. Two years ago, billionaires made so much money that they could have ended extreme poverty seven times. Now, let's just stop there for a second. That's just one year. That's not all the money that the billionaires have. We're just asking them to forego one year so that we could end extreme poverty. They're still going to be really, really rich. That next year they can get back to their profits. But they're not doing this. So if the Calvary that we traditionally might think of as being able to solve this problem won't solve it, then how about we solve it? You fight the fights that need fighting, not just the ones you feel comfortable fighting. You fight the fights that your constituencies, that your students, that their communities, that your people need fighting. That is where we find ourselves. So this brings us to my favorite topic, Paul Quinn College, because I am the president of Paul Quinn College. Therefore, it seems like it should be one of my favorite topics, right? Um, so at Paul Quinn College, we believe in a very simple notion, and that is this that institutions of higher education have a responsibility to turn themselves outward and address the needs of the day for the communities that they serve. They don't get to hide behind their, hide in their ivory towers and behind their walls. We have to get out beyond those places and engage in the needs and the issues of the day. Now, I'm not telling you that that's the safest course of action. I'm not telling you that that's why you go out and you get your PhD or whichever degree that you pursued. What I am telling you is that is the reality of our lives now. We no longer can just sit places and go to conferences where we talk to people who believe the things that we believe and don't address the needs of the students. But if we choose not to address the needs of the students, then we cannot be angry when the students hate us. They hate us because we've ignored them. They hate us because they see the possibility of hope, and we have extinguished that because we have not listened to their voices. At Paul Quinn College, we chose to listen to their voices. And, and let me be very, very clear. It's hard to have less resources than we have, right, in a traditional sense. Because what we don't have in traditional financial resources, we make up for in our sheer will, right? We will not back down. We will believe, we believe that we will find a way or we will make a way. Right? We are unapologetic about that. So when schools come to us and say, well, how do you how do you do that? You know, how 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 and I hear this everywhere I go. 
how did you find the money to do it? My response is, how do you find the will not to do it? How do you find the will not to listen to the needs of your student? And I'm going to give you some examples of the needs of our students. So this mural really represents our story. We are an institution that came out of slavery. That is what historically black colleges are. They were born from one of the most heinous traditions this world has ever known, the slave trade. In 1872, Paul Quinn College was founded. It was founded to pull slaves and the descendants of slaves off of plantations and into the enlightened life that you see in that picture. That is what we were founded to do. We will not back down from that history. We're not going to run from that history. We embrace that history. We think it's a hell of a history, right? Because there's been nothing like it. How do you educate an entire group of people who have been disenfranchised intentionally? Well, I, I take that back. You all know something about that, right? That's your task as well, right? Which is why our task, our walks are so similar. So this is what our story would, I would argue, we are doing today what we were always born to do, what we always should be doing. This is our ethos. We believe in we over me. The needs of a community must supersede the wants of an individual. We don't believe that you should ever get to be selfish. We think selfish people destroy the fabric of communities. So we've built an entire institution around these values. Right? We think that it's critical. This is our formula. We preach hope because, remember, our students are coming to us with, with hope. We practice patience because you cannot take students in the imperfect form and think that it's going to be a smooth, quick process of transformation. That is not how it works. And newsflash, that's not how it worked for us either. Right, because sometimes we get to these places and we forget who we were at the beginning of our journey. I was not a finished product when I showed up on a college campus at 17 years old. And neither are our students. So we need to be patient with them. And you cannot preach patience enough or practice patience enough. We instill resilience because you must have the fortitude to keep going. Even when the road is rough, rugged, and hard, you must keep going because there is power in the fact that you refuse to yield to the circumstances around you. That at its core is what resilience is about. So we instill resilience in our students. We teach them to be entrepreneurial in their thoughts and their action. Our students must become the entrepreneurs of their own lives. Now, that can mean that they start businesses but what it really means is whatever they face in life, that they have the ability to navigate that. There is no textbook on how you live a life that matters. There isn't. All you can do is equip people to adapt to the changes that they are going to see, to the obstacles that will come in their path. That is one of the things that we do. But maybe the most important piece that we do is we lead with love. And I know that it may seem unusual for a college president to talk about love. I would tell you, I think it's sad that more don't. Because we are in this business because we love our students. And if you are not in this business because you love your students, don't tell me now. Okay, we can talk about it afterwards. I can have some career recommendations for you. Because you are in the wrong business. You cannot do what needs to be done. You cannot be who our students need us to be if you don't find it in your heart to love them. Now, I was not always that person. Uh, in all truth and, uh, and candor, I was not. When I became president at Paul Quinn, um, it was an institution that was failing. It had 18 months to survive. Um, it had been told that. We had 30 days of cash on hand. Um, you were very generous describing our graduation rate at 5%. It was actually 1%, and it had to be rounded up. And, and let me just stop for a moment. No, that's a true story, okay? That's a true story. D 
Do you have any idea how committed people must be to not graduate 99% of the students that come to them? I mean, I, I just, I stop here for a moment because I think the genius of that just mediocrity must be identified. You cannot do that easily, right? You can't. Every system that you have must fail, right? Every hiring decision you make must be a bad one. I mean, it is just, it's extraordinary. It is extraordinary. And I can laugh about that now because I could not laugh about it then. It was painful, all right? It was painful. And I've had to explain to people that reality for 12 years. It has been a pain. This is cathartic for me, so just thank you for giving me my therapy moment. All right? But when I was offered the opportunity, and, and by the way, let me tell you how that happened. I was literally driving down the highway. I was an entrepreneur. I was building a business, and I was partnering with some friends of mine to buy a professional basketball team. And I was going to get to be part owner of that team and president of that team. And when you do those things, you're going to be really, really rich, okay? And I was ready to be really, really rich, okay? I, I had picked out a Range Rover. I had picked out a house. I mean, I was headed for a very different life, and I was happy about that. And the chair of the board calls and says, hey, would you be interested in being president? And here's the thing. When people call you up to offer you a job that you didn't apply for, <laughs> there's a catch. There's a catch, right? Now, you might be one of those people that sits around and believes that you're so amazing that people just call you up all the time and say, hey, I have a job for you, right? If you're that person, you have an ego problem, <laughs> all right? You need therapy, and we can talk afterwards as well, right? The reality of it is they probably called you because no one else would take the job. I understand. I had to have been the last choice for the presidency of this institution. How else do you come up with a guy who didn't apply, who had no experience in higher education? I mean, like, literally, I had no experience other than I had a bunch of degrees. Okay, my sister, who is a school teacher in Chicago, she reminds me of that often, right? She's just like, this is ridiculous. You have no higher ed training. I was like, yes, but I am the college president, right? <laughs> so, but I... I understood that I wasn't the first choice, but it didn't mean that I wasn't right for the job. And to lead means you must be in a continuous relationship with the management of one's own ego. It is never about us. It is always about them. Amen. And <laughs> there we go. Now we're going to church, right? <laughs> Now, I am starting the offering plate with you, okay? <laughs> so the, the reality of it is I took this job and I was scared. I had just turned 40. Um, I wasn't married. I had just come out of a divorce. Um, and I didn't know how bad it was. And it was really public. In fact, no one told me to take this job. No, I take that back. One person told me to take it. It was a woman that I was dating at the time. Um, and I figured she was just trying to get in good. Um, it clearly worked because I married her, by the way. Uh, you know, listen, when you find somebody that supports you, grab them, okay? Uh, but I was, we had, a, we had a room. It was the president's dining room. And in that room were all the pictures of the presidents of Paul Quinn. And I was the last picture on the wall. And every day I went home with the reality that if I didn't succeed, I would forever be the last picture on the wall. And the school had survived Reconstruction. The school had survived the Great Depression. The school had, had survived Jim Crow. But it wasn't going to survive me. And that terrified me. So one day I'm on campus, and so I was stressed out all the time. So one day I'm on campus and I get into an argument with one of my students, a male student. And we're yelling at each other and we're probably using language that is not very college presidential. Um, but I would tell you I haven't always been a college president, okay? And we get to my office and we're yelling and screaming and cussing each other out and he breaks down in tears. 
Now, that version of me wasn't prepared for that moment, right? Because I was like, listen, man, like you're a dude. Like how you gonna sit here, cuss me out, and then cry, right? I had all types of toxic masculinity going on, okay? And I was just like, you punk, right? <laughs> so I had one of my staff members with me, and she was the quintessential, and, and I don't know if you all know this, this figure, but it's a Southern mother, right? It's a black Southern mother. And she, she tends to be very, very maternal and, and just very nurturing when she wants to be, and, and, but strong and, and tough all at the same time. So Ms. Dickinson comforted the young man and got him out of the office. And then, you know, I th I'm sitting there thinking like, Psh, this guy. Then she turns around and comes back and sits down and looks at me over her glasses with just disgust, right? And she's just like, baby, I met your mother. And she had indeed met my mother, right? One of the few people in Dallas that had met my mother before my mother passed. And she said, your mother loved you, but your mother was tough on you. She said, so you grew up in a house of tough love. She said, you know, in fact, you do bear all the signs of someone that might have been, she said, no, she said, you have never one moment in your life questioned if you were loved. She said, in fact, you bear all the signs of someone who's been overloved. And I was like, overloved? Are you dissing me, right? I'm like, I think you're talking trash to me, okay? And she said, let me ask you something. She said, if you spent your life growing up without love, and someone enters the picture preaching tough love, would you ever hear anything other than tough? She said, I know you love our students, and I know you love our staff, but you're tough on us. You're really tough on us. And if you want us to follow you, if you want us to trust you, you're going to need to lead with love. The single best leadership advice I've ever had in my life. I would tell you that advice not only saved my presidency or changed my presidency, it saved my presidency, but it changed and saved me as a man, right? Because it gave me the strength, the perspective, and the ability to allow myself to be publicly vulnerable, to be my most authentic self. And if you remember nothing about our time together today, I want you to remember that point. We have to be our authentic selves. Our students and our communities need us to be human. They need to know who we really are. They need to understand what our fears are, what our hopes are, what our dreams are. They need to know when you messed up so they can understand that it's okay when they mess up. And when we do that, we change the relationship that they will have, not just with us, but with the institution that we represent. And that institution is more than just the name of the college on our walls. It is the institution of education. And if we are going to really achieve our next being greater than our now, that has to happen. So this is who we are as an institution. And this is why leading with love is so important. 80 to 90% of our students are Pell Grant eligible. And Pell Grant eligible in the United States means you come from the lowest socioeconomic strata in the country. So our students are among the poorest people in America. Their average ACT score, which is one of the standardized tests that are used for gauging college readiness, is a 17. That is not the college readiness score. The college readiness score is in the 20s. So our students are considered unprepared. 23% of our students are Latinx students. So people are always surprised. They think, well, you're a historically black college, so everyone's black. No, everyone is not black, right? We have a diverse student body. 40% just means that 40% of our students come from outside the state of Texas. So we have a national student body, an increasingly an international student body. Now I want to tell you some stories about my students so you understand and see them and understand why we feel so passionately about them. This is Jasmine Norman. Jasmine Norman graduated number two in her high school class from an inner city high school in Memphis, Tennessee. 
Jasmine Norman comes from a messy family background. Her half-sister is her classmate in high school and at Paul Quinn. So I'm going to let you figure out how that happens, okay? We have a program that we do almost every year at Paul Quinn now called Dear World, where people come in and our students and staff write messages that they are feeling at that moment on their bodies. It is a cathartic process that allows people to introduce themselves to the community. What Jasmine wanted everyone to know is that she was a rose who grew from the concrete. Now, I don't know how many of you are Tupac fans. Is this a Tupac crowd? You're a Tupac fan? There were a lot of people I expected to say they were Tupac fans, right? I love this place, okay? All right, Tupac Shakur was an American artist, uh, a poet, uh, a rapper. Uh, so we call it rhythmic American poetry, right? But he was a poet. He wrote this incredible book of poems that is under-celebrated. And in one of them, he talks about being a rose that grew from the concrete. Our institutions understand that roses can grow from the concrete. We just think they shouldn't have to, right? This is my adopted daughter, Treasure Butler. And let me tell you her story. Her high school principal called me and said, we have a student that we want to send to you, and, but she's going to need a little more of your attention. And I said, oh, that's fine. You know, we do that. And she said, no, 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 no. I need you to know her story so you understand why she needs your attention. Her drug addict mother put her on her father's doorstep as a young child, five or six years old, and she had never been to school. She had lived in squalor. Her father, and, and her mother was one of seven women he had had children with. He also was a drug addict, but did have an amazing mother, sister, grandmother, who put the girl in her arms and tried to do best for her. She struggled in grammar school, but saw a school that represented a different life for her. She took the bus for hours to get to that school every day. When she came to Paul Quinn, she didn't have anything she needed. I didn't fully appreciate what she was dealing with until we do a summer program that I'll talk about in a minute. She at the end of the summer program, I was in San Francisco where she's from, and she invited me to dinner at her home. So I went to have dinner at her home. And the women in her family were amazing. Her father, who was high when I got there, um, could barely even bring himself to sit at the table and have dinner with us, right? He refuses to financially support her. Imagine being a young girl and your father the only parent that you have a relationship with won't even send you money for toiletries, right? So for the last four and a half years, I have been her father. I bought her toiletries. My family has, she has spent holidays with us. My kids think of her as their big sister. Uh, she calls my little son dweeb, right? They have this whole dweeb thing going on. I just let it be, right? Um, she is extraordinary. She has cried on my shoulder about why her father doesn't love her. Do you know what it's like to be a girl who thinks that your father doesn't love you? Do you know what that can do to you? Part of the reason why we are so passionate about providing mental health resources is because of the experiences we have with students like Trejour. I can give her every ounce of love that I have but it is never going to make up for the fact that the person she looked to love for first rejected her. But that's just two of our students. This is Arielle Clarkson. She is living with kidney failure. She's brilliant and lives with the knowledge every day that she may never get to actualize her brilliance because her body might not let her. She has mental illness issues as well, but she was the two-time president of our Student Government Association. She is a passionate advocate for the underserved and the under-resourced. 
but because she herself is underserved and under-resourced, she didn't get the medical care that she needed in time. She started getting the medical care that she needed because she asked me to go to her doctor's appointments with her. One doctor's appointment, we ran into a doctor who, as luck would have it, I was the commencement speaker at, her son, at his son's college graduation. He ordered the extra test that she needed to identify that she had a rare kidney illness. She now is waiting for a kidney transplant that we pray will come. But that's just three of our stories. This is Vincent Owaseni, who, as you guess, comes from Nigeria. He is the greatest student that this school will ever have produced. It took me two years to recruit him. His Nigerian dad was not persuaded by my charms the first two years, right? Brent, brilliant, Vincent is brilliant. He was always going to be brilliant. The reason this picture is here is because of who he's hugging. That is Nadil Molina, whose family is from Puerto Rico. Nadil and Vincent were high school classmates, except they were high school classmates that represented the opposite ends of the spectrum. Vincent was number one in the class. Nadi was not number one. Okay, we'll just leave it at that. But Nadi is the most amazing soul. To get his family's permission to come to Paul Quinn, I had to go to his niece's Quintanera, where I was one of the few people in that room that did not speak Spanish. So they lined up all of the family and me, literally sitting in a chair, and they started grilling me about him coming to college. Thankfully, my wife spoke Spanish. So, you know, I just sort of was like, have you met my wife, right? <laughs> this picture I love because of the journey they have taken together. Nadi wasn't supposed to graduate from college. He wasn't even supposed to go to college. His own family told him they didn't think he should go to college because they didn't think he was smart enough because he is dyslexic and no one took the time to address it. We did. But that's just two more stories, which leads us to who we are as an institution. Our goal is to end poverty. Our goal is to end poverty because the student stories that you have heard are what happens when you don't end poverty. When people grow up in poverty, they are managed to believe that their lives will never be as full as everyone else's. That's not right, and we think we have a way of doing that, of ending that. We call it reality-based education. We think you take the issues that students have in their lives, you incorporate them into the classroom, and you build an experience based on that, right? And here's what you do. So these are some of our students and staff. We turned our football field into a farm, right? And our, and our American football field, because we still play soccer, right? We're not savages, okay? <laughs> so we... We terminated football because A, we were terrible at it, but B, we couldn't afford it, all right? And we turned the football field into an organic farm because the community surrounding the college is in a food desert. We were closer to the city's garbage dump than we were a grocery store. How is that right? It's not. But we had the ability to do something about that, so we did. We terminated the football program, we turned the football field into a farm, we told that story everywhere we went. We give away 10% of everything that we grow. We call that tithing to the community. We are advocates for our people. This was the first example of how we met people where they were and lifted them to the places where their dreams should be. So that's the first step in reality-based education. But that led to the second step. The city tried to turn the garbage dump in the community into a super garbage dump, one of the largest in the United States. And they didn't even think it was important to do a community impact study to figure out what that meant. The man in the middle is Dexter Evans. Dexter Evans was the Student Government Association president at that time. He led a movement called We Are Not Trash. All right? My students, and at the time, we only had 200 students at the school. And when we would do protests, we would just shut down school, put everybody on buses, and we would all go protest. Right? And people were like, wow, you all are so unified. How many people do you have? We have thousands, thousands of people, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, just don't look too close. But 
That was a student-led movement to fight environmental injustice. So we started to figure out that every issue that we had was stemming from our place in the socioeconomic strata. And that if we wanted to give our students a better lives, we we're gonna have to incorporate all of this. So this is what it looks like. We created something called the Urban Work College Model, which means that all of our students get jobs, right? If you live on campus, you get a job. And the next iteration of this is if you come to Paul Quinn, you get a job. Because people always talk about education cures poverty. I know this is a room full of educators, but I'm just gonna throw a controversial thought out there. I actually think money ends poverty, right? I think if people have money, they can get out of poverty. So it's not either or, it's both and. You need an education, but you really need money. So we started helping our students earn money while they go to school. We reduced tuition and fees. We cut tuition and fees by $10,000, right? So now it costs less than $16,000 a year to go to school. We created a pathway where students can graduate with around $10,000 of debt. We have a new model that we're going to experiment with this coming year where students can graduate with $1,000 of debt. But we can talk about that a little bit later. And our students get two to four years of internships. Remember the data that talked about jobs wanting people to have work experience? That's how you get them work experience. This is our model. This is what education at Paul Quinn looks like now from a financial and operational aspect. But this is what it looks like from an academic aspect. We created something called the Quinite Arts. Now, for those of you that are true academics, you know the liberal arts. And you know how people abuse the liberal arts these days and say that they're irrelevant. I would argue with you they're not irrelevant. But if you had made no changes to an institution since the medieval times, might you be a little dated? Right? So we decided to update the liberal arts. Now, we call them the Quinite Arts because we're Paul Quinn. We created it. We got there first, so we get to name it, right? That's just how this stuff works. So it's called the Quinite Arts. So we looked at the traditional liberal arts notion of grammar and said, well, that's just writing. And by the way, we came up with this because we asked businesses and corporate America. Five minutes? All right. I got a little... Got a little excited, so I'm going to have to expedite the rest of this, okay, because I'm about to be given the hook, but we'll get through this, okay? We asked corporate America, what do you need to be successful? They said people need to be able to write, they need to be able to speak well, they need to be able to work in teams, and they need to have digital literacies. All right, here's what that translates into. The traditional liberal arts notion of grammar is writing. So every class at Paul Quinn College now requires students to write papers. And every semester that you're there, you take a writing class. So by the time our students graduate now, they will have had anywhere from four years, to, I'm sorry, four semesters to eight semesters of writing experience. Speaking across the curriculum is the traditional liberal arts notion of rhetoric. Critical thinking is the traditional liberal arts version of logic. So all of these are now built into the day-to-day -day experience that our students are having. Then we added one more building digital mastery across the curriculum. Well, that didn't exist in medieval times, so we had to create that one. So here's what all this means. When you graduate from Paul Quinn College, you will have paid, 60, if you are there for four years, you will pay less than $64,000 for a college degree in which you get three types of education. You get your subject matter mastery, which is what you studied, what you majored in. You get your digital mastery because you, every semester, our students are getting one, every year, they're getting one to two certificates in digital learning, right? Could be Microsoft Word, it could be coding, could be data science, but they have the ability to work in, is that the hook? No, is that someone's fault? Oh, I literally thought that's the nicest hook I've ever heard in my life, right? <laughs> um, but building digital mastery. And then the third is experiential learning from their four years of real world work experience. All right, this is what else we realized that we had to provide. Summer Bridge is a way to get our students on campus before they start college. Using the Pell Grant program, they pick up nine credit hours for free, right, which gets them jump-started in college and allows us to graduate them early. Mental health culture. Poverty creates trauma. 
You cannot educate a student if their mind is not healthy. Right? You can't educate an unhealthy mind. It's too hard. So we created a mental health culture where literally we do town hall meetings twice a year about mental health. We get up, we make it safe for people to talk about the issues they have and to get the help they need. If you come to our campus, you will hear people talk openly about the need to go see a counselor. We have removed the stigma of that by putting it in the daylight and then having all of us, even the adults talk about, or the staff talk about their need and their experiences with mental health as well. That has changed us. Instead of calling it an uh, Office of Career Development, we call it an Office of Prestigious Opportunities. Because people never talk to students from poverty about prestigious opportunities. We think your life and your career should be a prestigious opportunity. We also want it to be an institution that produces Rhodes Scholars. So we just combine the two. We have an Office of Prestigious Opportunities. We revise the academic calendar so that students who are coming from places of poverty aren't feeling ostracized. At Paul Quinn, the semester's over at Thanksgiving. So students don't have the, the pressure of trying to figure out how do I get home at Thanksgiving, come back to school, and then two or three weeks later go home for Christmas. Right? Instead of being at someone else's home for Thanksgiving wishing you were with your family and being reminded that you aren't because of your economic limitations, we've created an academic calendar where you start a little early, you finish early, you spend both your holidays at home with your family. We've normalized that so people aren't feeling stigmatized. Then we have a travel abroad requirement. Starting next fall, every student at Paul Quinn College must travel abroad before they graduate because we think it's important for them to understand that they are part of a global family, that there's something bigger out there in the world than the community that they came from, that they aren't alone. And the power of understanding that you aren't alone is everything. Now, because this is a conference that believes in data, here's some data points for you. For those of you who might be asking, does this work? Hell yes, it works, <laughs> all right? At graduation, 74% of our alums are employed. 100% of our alums who go through the corporate work program are employed at graduation. Our retention rate, which was 33% when I arrived, is now into the 70s. Our enrollment has increased 250% since 2010, and things keep getting better. Our graduation rate has jumped to 25%. It projects in the next five years to take another 20% jump, right? Our goal is to graduate everyone that comes to us. People don't send you their children for them to fail. They send, you to their, they send them to you to succeed. We think 100% should be the goal. Here's evidence of our, another piece of evidence of our success. We're expanding. We've opened up a second campus in, P in Plano, Texas. Our goal, our overall goal, let me skip ahead for a second. Our overall goal is to scale. We're going to open up campuses all over the world using this model. PQC Global is what we are headed for. Now, last evidence of our success, are these are some of our partners. Some of them are places that hire our students, places like FedEx and Liberty Mutual, AT&T, J.P. Morgan Chase. But some of them are our funding partners, one of which is one of the, I guess, the supporter of this event, the Kresge Foundation, which we thank Bill um, because when I first met Bill, we first met in Austria, is that right? There's no way at that moment Bill thought that they would ever fund us. And it's okay. It's all right. I understood it because he shouldn't have funded us at that point, right? But what I appreciate the most about Kresge is Kresge allowed us to grow and believed in us, right? And you need people who believe in you. And, and that is where I want to end my remarks today by telling you this. You must be the people who believe in the transformative ability of your students and the communities that they come from. You must believe that their next can be better than their now. However messy their now is, however messy they are, they're coming from places that have produced that. We must be the lights in their lives. We must be the repairs of the breaches in their lives. When we do that, when we become more than just places they come to get a degree, when we become places that see them, see all of them, respond to the needs in their lives, then we will have lived up to our promise. Then we will live up to our potential. Then we will be the institutions that we should be. We will then become less about being higher educational institutions and more about movements. And what this world needs right now are those type of movements. 
I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I thank you for the honor of your attention. I am sorry for running over time because I do want to be invited back at some point in my life. So thank you and best of wishes to you. Take care. Um, uh, thank you, Michael. I think that was great. And, um, just to say, uh, uh, the, uh, we break up into sessions now. Uh, those of you who want to continue to engage with Michael, please remain here. And uh, if you look into the program, I mean, you'll see you know, where the other sessions are running. Um, Catherine. Um, and just, uh, just to say, uh, again, a big thank you to Michael and uh, to say that, uh, you know, that so many of the challenges that he faces are kind of are also challenges that we face. And, and, and I think there's a, there's, a lot, there's a lot that we can learn by sharing and so on. Uh, I'm going to call on Jenny to hand over the gift, I think. Yeah.